Praise the Lord. Bishop David Oginde and your dear wife, the entire pastoral team of Sitam Valley Road, elders and deacons, and other workers in the house of the Lord, I greet you all in the name of our Lord. I'm so humbled by this invitation to come and speak the word of the Lord, whereby I will not speak as a professor, though I am a professor. I will speak as a servant of the Lord who is ordained and serves as a pastor too. Hallelujah. And so, I feel humbled by being here, knowing that in the 1970s, this was our preferred church when we were students at Kenyatta University. I remember the days of Mervyn Thomas, Roy Upton, and then, of course, I went to Mombasa to teach at Craft Memorial secondary school and then came back to Nairobi to do my masters at Kenyatta University and eventually was able to be absorbed there as a tutorial fellow rising through the ranks to become a full professor before I moved to the International uh, Leadership University then NIST in 2010. I retired as a vice chancellor, voluntarily, on 30th of July last year. And so I'm happy that you can be a leader and allow another leader to take over and you humble yourself to serve under him. May we turn to the book of Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm going to speak on a topic of occupy till I come. And it is a long reading, so in the interest of time, let me not read all the scriptures related, but is normally referred to as the parable of ten talents, or the talent of ten minas. So verse 13 says, so he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, do business till I come. That which the new King James renders as do business till I come, the new living translation puts it that he left, before he left, he called them together telling them, invest this for me while I am gone. The original King James Version says, Occupy till I come. Beloved, there are a number of things that my spirit has been drawn its attention to in this word. Occupy. You are being charged with a responsibility as a believer to occupy. This occupying means go out and reproduce. And I know that it is possible that in your Christian life you may have lived two weeks, one month, three months, six months, 
even a year, you as an individual, not having brought a single soul to the Lord. What does that mean? It means, my brother, my sister, you are not being effective in your Christian testimony and practice. And so, a number of things we need to point out. Occupy till I come does carry with it a motif of multiplying disciples of Christ. There is a multiplication imperative. You are called to the family of God to reproduce and multiply. But then, effective multiplying of disciples in Christian life and ministry is something that will take place only when you have entered into an intimate relationship with the Lord. It is not possible to reproduce when there is no intimacy that is brought about by the sanctifying work of the Spirit of God in you and he is equipping you with the tools and gifts with which you can effectively multiply. And so this scripture of occupying till I come, we need to know is a scripture that is being given in the context of the parable of ten talents or ten minors. And this parable has a central thrust. And the thrust of this parable is stewardship of God's resources and utilizing these resources of God productively in our Christian life. So the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, what is the key towards spiritual vitality and productivity as confessing Christians? And we need to understand, beloved, Christ has given us an assignment until he returns. And so you and I Require to be sure that when Christ returns, he will demand of you and me to give an account of that which has been given to us to multiply. We have been called to the kingdom of God and entrusted with his resources. And you may ask, what are these resources that have been given to us that we ought to endeavor to multiply? Indeed, we have been given resources including money. We have been given resources including time. We have been given resources including our bodies and how we use our bodies. We have been given resources in terms of human resources called people whom we need to lead to the Lord and whom we need to establish good relationships. Christianity involves is a matter of managing relationships. We have been given again spiritual gifts. All this have been given to us to manage and to deploy for the single purpose of expanding and multiplying the kingdom of God. And the Apostle Paul had a very profound understanding of this charge that by the leading of the Holy Spirit, he does talk a very important message regarding the nature of our stewardship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says that one ought to regard us as stewards of the mysteries of the power of God. And 
it behooves those of us who are stewards to be trustworthy. Trustworthiness is an important demonstration of our godly stewardship. And so there are important things that you can consider in that account that is given by the Apostle Paul of stewardship. One is that we are servants. And you cannot be a servant who offers service unless you have a cultivation of a heart of servanthood. Stewardship that involves servanthood. And you need to recognize the fact that it is a requirement because the scripture says now it is required that those who have been given this trust must prove faithful. There is a cultivation that takes place. There is a process of intimacy that takes place before a quality and Christ-like character of faithfulness is engendered and displayed in your life. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about this task that is at hand of proving faithful. It relates to a very important subdivision that I want to make and which many people are not pursuing with understanding as to the connection between the two. The call of God upon your life. The call of God upon your life has two dimensions. The first dimension is his primary call. Calling you from among them. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 7. Come out and be separate and touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters. Thus says the Lord. He is calling you from among them and calling you to be separated unto him. That is the primary call, the call to salvation where you enjoy a relationship of intimacy with your maker. It is primary. And knowing that it is primary, when you have been called unto him, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1, says, having these promises, therefore, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the spirit and body, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. The primary call being brought to the kingdom of God is a call. And this primary call is characterized by winning. You have been won to the Lord. And you have been won to the Lord so that you in turn can win others to the Lord. But there are some people who are so complacent that they are going to heaven. They don't care about the perishing. You are one to the Lord so that you can win others to the Lord. And winning others to the Lord is bringing forth the fruit Christ. What kind of fruit? The fruit that lasts. Hallelujah. It is the primary call whereby there's no way and I repeat there is no way you can be faithful without handling well this primary call. So the question you need to ask yourself is how am I handling the primary call? It is a call that demands of you and I, godliness. It requires godly stewardship of the resources given to us. Hallelujah. And therefore, it is a response and a handling of that with a consciousness of the godliness and the primacy of this call. The way you respond, the Lord will commend you or the Lord will condemn you. 
And I know when we are faithful, the scripture is clear that now there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so the key element of faithfulness that Paul is itemizing in that scripture of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it is identifying the various dimensions of faithfulness which is cultivated in the process of your being brought on to the Lord as a response to the primary call. Number one, accountability as a very important facet of faithfulness. Number two, prepared, preparedness. Number three, commitment. And number four, frugality. Frugality, to be frugal is to be economical. And you notice there are quite a number of Christians who are born again, they are spirit-filled, but they are not frugal. Their life is characterized by wastage. And we will see how this contributes to our maximization of the opportunities that God has given to us. Let us start with accountability. Because true stewards are called upon to give an account. True stewards are, are answerable to God for everything that they do. And therefore, they are positively responsive to the primary call because they sense that they are liable. Now, Romans chapter 8 verse 12 shows us this sense of liability when the Bible says, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation when you find you don't have a sense of obligation, remember there can be no integrity where there is no obligation. And therefore for that matter, where is our obligation? Our obligation, the Bible says, it is not to our sinful nature. That is the flesh. Our obligation is not to live according to the demand and dictates of the flesh. But, the scripture continues to say, if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Why? Because those who are led by the spirit of God, those are the sons of God. That is fundamentally why we are being brought into this relationship as a primary core. And in answer to that, we should know that we are entering a relationship where we no longer have no obligation to the world. We no longer have an obligation to our bodies. We have an obligation to the Spirit of God. So that we may be led by the Spirit of God. The question is, my beloved brother, my beloved sister, are you demonstrating that you have an obligation to the Spirit? Hallelujah. We have an obligation to the Spirit. And the Spirit's response to our yieldedness to Him is renewal of our minds, which is the key to our transformation. The transformation of our inner being so that our being is aligned and conformed to the image of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. I have heard people condemning this word, conform. Yes, it is condemned insofar as you conform to the world. But you are transformed by the renewing of your mind so that when you are transformed, the Spirit aligns you and conforms you to only the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Are you really being aligned? Kenya will not be what it is, full of corrupt pharaohs. Kenya will be not what it is, full of tribalists who have made tribes their idols. So there's a lot of idolatry simply because the majority of Christians who are calling themselves Christians and the statistics say they are 80%. But may I shock you, do your serious research, those people who have an intimate walk with the Lord and are being led by the Spirit of God do not constitute even 4%. Are 
are you one of that small percentage? That is why, really, this primary call needs to be taken a little bit more seriously than people seem to be doing. There can be no integrity where there's no sense of obligation. And when we are transformed and aligned to the image and purposes of Christ, then we develop the humility and gentleness of being accountable to one another. When you are accountable to one another, you overcome a disease called impunity. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says, So each one of us shall give an account of himself. That's why because of the weight given to the importance of this primary call, I dare say, do not postpone your being transformed. And this leads me to a second very primary factor in the factors identified by Paul called preparation. We need to be adequately prepared. And that's where the church again in Kenya is so weak. Because it is this preparation that uh, entails uh, discipling or discipleship making. And that is where the true fiber or fabric of Christianity is made. Through discipleship and discipling. It is making a kind of preparedness which is at the heart of true Christianity. Where you are. How deeply have you been discipled? By enhancing our spirituality through spiritual disciplines, we are able to cultivate virtues and the discipline of godly stewardship. And that is why Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31 says, A horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. A horse is prepared. You, like a horse, must be prepared. There are stages of preparation. It is not a simple act. It is a process. Are you submitting to this process? Preparation. And that's why even the scripture talks of our feet being yeah, pre wearing the shoes of the gospel of preparation. Oh my God. We need to be prepared. We need to submit ourselves to the process of being taught and instructed and prepared to reflect the discipline of true believers. This country is actually full of Christian rogues because discipling as a process is shambolic. Thirdly, Paul talks about commitment. True stewards are called upon to be committed. The stewardship of commitment demands personal fidelity, integrity, and devotion. And our commitment is enhanced by listening to the word of God, by reading the word of God, by acting on the word of God, and by persistent prayer, engaging in the discipline of persistent prayer. Oh, there are people who pray for only a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes, and they are satisfied that per day. I tell you, those are chapati type of prayers. Pray without ceasing. And men always ought to pray. Jesus instructed us. We need to engross ourselves in the discipline of prayer. It will reflect that commitment. And we need to ask God persistently for opportunities to be witnesses. And when you ask him for opportunities to be witnesses, doors of witnessing will begin to open. God is calling us to the commitment of the church and its membership to a missiological purpose. You as an individual having a missiological purpose. The church as a corporate entity nursing and enhancing a missiological purpose. A missiological purpose to the neighborhood and to the nations. And that clip that was given there is a clip that is encouraging that you are seeing beyond here. You want more people to know the gospel. You as an individual, are you identifying yourself with that? And what is your participation level? Ministry is what the church is called to do. Ministry is meeting the needs of other peoples, meeting those needs physically, meeting them mentally, meeting them emotionally, and of course, meeting them spiritually. Ministry is going, going out there 
to evangelize and make disciples. We have to win people to Christ because through his grace we were one. And when we win them unto Christ, we must build them. We must train them. And after we have trained them, we must send them to the mission field. Win, build, and send. We win through evangelizing. We win and train and change people's behavior through the discipleship process that I have described so that they are effective followers who have been discipled. And we send them through commissioning them to go out there for ministry. And we send them for ministry to plant churches. And I'm glad that is a burden onto this church to plant new churches. And not only planting churches, but also sending them in the marketplace. In the marketplace, yes. So that these people who have the DNA of Christ because they are sharing in his heavenly pedigree and the spirit of holiness is operating in them, they will be able to infect marketplaces with Christ-like values and practices. When you send them there and their values are different and they are kingdom-minded because of a godly perspective which they have impressed, what will happen to them? They will bring about a change in the logic of the market. The logic of the market allocates value to the powerful. And therefore you will be powerful in the marketplace depending on who is behind your mission. If it is God driving you by his spirit and revelation and that it will be accompanied with signs and wonders, you are powerful your influence on the marketplace will grow and expand. Because Christians are going to the marketplace without that transformation which takes place in the primary phase, when they go out there, they go as underlings who are full of compromises and apologies and they conform and the world prevails and they grow cold. Are you one of them? Our commitment, beloved, hallelujah, to do the work of ministry must be born of the Holy Spirit's conviction. And we must move from complaining to missional intervention in order to make a difference in society. And let me identify some four steps that are critical even in our intervention in the marketplace, in the world out there to make a difference. Number one, the first step is conviction. The first step to commitment is conviction. You know, you distinguish between conviction and preference. Prefer, preference. Are you doing what you're doing because you prefer? Or is it a matter of conviction? The second step to commitment is conversion to Christ so that you are complete and radically changed. And I can tell you, we need a change of mind that leads to a change of life and lifestyle. So that conversion, so that you shed off the old things, is what is done through discipling. Number three, the third step to commitment is confidence. We need to build our confidence so that we can be able to engage any person in society about what we believe. And our faith is actually exercise of confidence in God. And we should stop wavering and being double-minded. And the fourth critical factor is that of uh, consecration. Being consecrated for the purposes of God in our life. Because consecration is being set apart to be reserved for God's use. And the church that comprises of membership that is concentrated then becomes a community of believers who embody kingdom values. And the act of consecration is the act of purifying ourselves and recommitting ourselves to a lifestyle of godliness. 
And we need, need therefore, beloved, to dedicate ourselves to the service of that God who has called us. And therefore, we must step away from idolatrous cultures surrounding us. Beloved, people of God, stewardship demands commitment born out of conviction. And for those who are undecided, paralyzed by indecision, indecision is a culprit of the inability to commit. Lastly, frugality. Frugality. We are supposed to be frugal stewards. And Jesus demonstrated the importance of frugality when he says very clearly in the scripture, John chapter 6 verse 12, collect all the fragments that nothing goes to waste. Many of us have a lot of ugali rotting in the dustbins because we prepare beyond our ability to consume. Because we don't have a frugal attitude of conserving resources and demonstrating efficiency in the use of resources. Frugality is a quality of being economical. In other words, of being parsimonious. And Adam Smith used the word parsimony. Jesus valued frugality and simplicity. And you see, our wastefulness goes, comes about because we are complex. And we want to make a name. And we want to make a statement by the way we spend because we have succumbed to the spirit of consumerism. We need to be frugal. The Christian call, yes, Christianity involves answering two calls, as I've said. The call to salvation, the primary call, and the call to ministry. But as I draw to a close, there are three relationships involved in our response to God's call. Number one, relationship with the Lord, which is a preparatory stage. And number two, relationship with one another, managing the gift of relationships which we can call social capital. Social capital is wealth. And number three, relationship with the world. That is whereby the impact on the marketplace is so prominent. God's kingdom is built by spiritual maturity. For you to have effect, for you to have a growing influence, you need to be a mature person. You have been called to a person at the level of the primary call and after God has prepared you and equipped you and released you for work in the mission field, you have a maturity in order to do works of service. Hallelujah. The first call is a primary call and the second call is a secondary call. Before we are called to do something, beloved, we are called to someone. We are called to Christ and to be his disciples. This is a call to be before a call to doing. The call to being is a call into an intimate relationship with Christ. The call to being is a call to mission. A call to impact the world after you have had profound fellowship with him. Hallelujah. It is a call, therefore, to impact from a position of maturity after you have been prepared. And that's why I see the relationship between spiritual maturity and fruit, fruit, fruitfulness in mission. Spiritual maturity is one of the markers of the true church. And our mission must follow our maturity. Spiritual maturity is not an instant. It needs to be worked out step by step. And therefore, it is demonstrated for those that have a relationship of intimacy. Intimacy with God. Can you say you have intimacy with God? Intimacy is an opportunity to grow. Intimacy with God is developed through spiritual disciplines. And after you have grown to mature because of your practice of spiritual discipline, this is what launches you out into service there as a minister of the word of God. Therefore, the secondary call is a call to a purpose which is divine. It is a purpose rather than a person. And that's why Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says, for we are God's masterpiece, you know, being molded and prepared. He has created us 
anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us a long time ago. When you have had a fruitful experience in your relationship with God, oh, you are ripe to demonstrate fruitfulness. And fruitfulness, therefore, comes from the God who is calling you into intimacy. When he says in James chapter 4, verse 7, such by verse 8, uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When you draw near to him and he draws near to you, there is intimacy. When you have intimacy, verse 7, therefore, beloved, sub submit yourself to God. And, he, and resist the devil and he will flee. Hallelujah. Your academic endowment, I'm an academician. As an academician, God has used me. I remember at one point when I was in the office as chairman of the Department of History, two or three students were coming to the Lord every day. And it happened for years. I know many of you are on WhatsApp. I am on WhatsApp. God challenged me what is my being on WhatsApp, which is like a marketplace kind of institution and platform. He told me, as a pastor, you can engage your church and the people on WhatsApp who are in your conducts daily with the word of God. And I remember this mechanic of mine who is a Muslim who has been repairing my car. And he's on my WhatsApp. I hesitated sending those devotions to him. I don't know whether Pastor B or the Bishop or Bingo have been seeing them. I hesitated for several days. I did not send him. But then God charged me. If you don't tell him, how will he know? So I put him on the list of my WhatsApp. So I sent and I sent and I have been sending him now for four months every day. One time when I did a survey to find out some feedback, I asked who are the people who feel this thing is being imposed on them? I should withdraw them. He was the first one to say, no, keep sending. Where you are as a believer, you don't have to be in the pulpit in order to share the gospel. Every one of us is a minister and a full-time minister. Because we have been called into a royal priesthood. And therefore, each one of us, unlike the old covenant, we are priests in the new covenant. And God is going to ask you to give an account of how you spend your moments in your office. When you are driving to the market and interacting with Mama Mboga, how did you account and make use of your time at that particular moment? Now listen to me. We are still at the even of the resources God has given us. And we have talked of the need to disciple and to train. I am sure, Bishop, there are needy students at Paku. Some of them are unable to complete in time. Yet they are being prepared to be workers in the ministry. When shall people as individuals say, I'll pick three students at Paco and be responsible for their training? When will people rise up and say, I'll take up students at Scott Theological College or even ILU as an individual without waiting to be prompted by the pastor? Just pay a visit and say, who are the needy ones? Who have even been thrown out of their houses because they have not paid their rent? And you say, Oh, yes, I want to be a good steward of my resources. Instead of having five cars in my compound, I'm going to sacrifice two for the sake of training God's workers. I don't have many cars myself. But at one time, I saw a team of young people who were doing ministry of praise and worship as a group, and they were carrying their things on Matatu. I took my pujo five or four and just gave it away. Hallelujah. To do the work of ministry. Selflessness is what characterized the early church. And the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, money answereth all things. So the needs that are in the marketplace which are tottering on slowness are because you procrastinate and you don't respond. As I speak, ending up, 
There are various levels I have identified, beloved. At the level of your money, you need to let go. I'm not saying that you leave your left, yourself starving, but you need a sense of parsimony to know what is enough and what can be used to bless the church of God. There's a second point of uh, your body. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore, I beseech you by the mercies of God to offer your body as a living sacrifice. You know, when you offer your body as a living sacrifice, you are preparing yourself to lead the life of the cross. You cannot enjoy the power of the resurrected life of Jesus, a spirit-filled life whereby you are full of the fullness of the spirit if you don't take up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow Jesus. So this body, oh yes, needs to be beaten down and that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, no, I beat up my body and make it my slave lest I preach to others but meet, miss the prize. Are you offering your body? It's an important resource. The Bible says the body belongs to the Lord. It is not for fornication. And the Bible says food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but both God will destroy. It will not matter how highly educated you are. Oh, my brethren, this body for it to do the will of God, it must be submitted to the maker to remold it. Hallelujah. Are you a good steward of your body? And I'm happy to see the chairman of my board here. I've just noticed him as I preach. It is a blessing. Hallelujah. The other thing is the resources. Before you can have power with God, go to God, submit to God, and let him give you the people so that you can enjoy influence power with the people. People are an important resource. Hallelujah. These are the few things I came to encourage you to stimulate you in divine thinking and pondering about the things of faith that can change us around and make us revolutionary as practitioners of Christianity to the extent that when we are revolutionized, the world will be taken captive. Hallelujah. Stop complaining and whining. You'll find out there a little book, Conquering the Complaining Spirit, written by me. You'll enjoy it at a very, very small fee of 300 shillings only. End of the Spirit Led Life by me, 200 shillings. And then there is a biblical Hebrew with vocabulary with an introduction by. Dr. Samuel Muindi, who is a Deputy Vice Chancellor, you can get those are professors at International Leadership University. Then there is Parenting God's Way by Professor Karioki. Mr. Makoha, who is a member of this church, and other people are out there to help you. And may I tell you, there are courses out there that you need. A Bachelor of Theology. There is Master of Arts in Leadership Studies. There is a Master of Science in Governance. There is Master of Counseling Studies. There is Master of Arts in Biblical and Theological Studies. And there is Master of Divinity. Beloved, these are courses that are preparing you, equipping you with skills for purposes of being effective in the marketplace. And not just in the marketplace. The theological courses and biblical studies courses equip you to stand in the pulpit. Kenya is characterized by a lot of drama in the pulpit. And to get the drama out of the pulpit, we need people to be trained and entrained. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so that is my humble submission in the spirit of the Lord. That as you go out after encountering these aging and graying professor. He is a professor full of the spirit of God. And his request and his imploring you is one. Get intimate with the Lord for you to be effective in witnessing. Because I cannot count the number of people who have come to know Christ. 
I know there are even some among here who relate with me at the level of discipleship. They know what the kind of man I am. I want to tell you it would not have happened if I was praying a five-minute prayer, a chapati type of prayer. I have serious consideration for intimacy with the Lord and devotion. And I'm telling you that's why there's an effective multiplication as a result of a life that is sown in the Lord. Because the scripture says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. That is the secret of multiplication. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.